Hi guys, so this video is going to cover a protein known as the botulinum toxin. So what is botulinum toxin? Well, to start, it's produced by a bacterium that bears the same name, Clostridium botulinum, and causes the disease, botulism, which stops muscular contractions. The way in which the toxin achieves this is blocking the release of acetylcholine from the synaptic cleft of the nerve endings where the muscles are, which inhibits the muscles from contracting. This toxin has also been famously associated with spoiled sausage, among other sources. While the disease has been around for centuries, it wasn't really first clinically described until the early 19th century, when the German physician Justinus Kerner called it sausage poisoning and studied it further, going as far as to even test it on himself. Even back then, Dr. Kerner proposed its therapeutic use, but that didn't come to fruition until about 1973, when a man by the name of Alan B. Scott researched serotype A as a possible treatment. Today, Botox is used to treat overactive muscles and nerves, which can cause pain, and it even treats wrinkles. With this established, now let's take a look at the protein structure itself in order to determine its function. So what we're looking at in this slide is serotype A of the botulinum toxin. Arguably because of its clinical significance, it's been studied the most, so I decided to make it the focus of this video because of its extensive background. All eight types are mostly homologous, so fortunately there's not that much variance among the structures. Speaking of the structures, they're comprised of three major regions, two heavy chains and one light chain, which we'll get into the details of them later. What I really want to bring the attention to are these key components that are seen in this picture. The disulfide bridge, which is in the center in color green, and the zinc ion binding motif, which the alpha helix is colored yellow and the zinc ion colored red. The two heavy chains are named after which end of the protein they're on. And right off the bat, we can see quite a few structural differences between them. The carboxyl end is very heavy in beta sheets, and the amino end is very heavy in alpha helices. In a highly favored reaction, the carboxyl end binds a toxin to the glycoproteins found inside the synaptic vesicles. While the amino end helps in binding too, its primary job is to move the light chain out of the vesicles. Another key difference between them is that while the amino end varies among the different serotypes, the carboxyl end remains relatively consistent throughout. Here's a closer view of the light chain. While it does vary among different serotypes, the motif remains relatively constant. The light chain is what gives the protein its toxic characteristic. What happens is the acidic environment of the vesicle dissociates the disulfide bond. From there, the amino heavy chain moves the light chain out of the vesicle and into the synaptic cytoplasm. The light chain will then cleave one of the three proteins of the snare complex, depending on its serotype. It's interesting to note that serotype C will not only cleave SNAP25, but it also cleaves another protein as well. This figure demonstrates how slight differences in the light chain not only affects which protein it binds to, but where on that protein. For example, serotypes A, C, and E all bind to the same protein, but they don't bind in the same location. The light chain, like many proteins, is highly selective. Now that we've gone over the mechanism by which botulinum toxin affects the body, now let's take a look at the actual effects themselves. Um, when someone contracts this poison. What happens is, obviously, like we've established, the receptors can't bind and the acetylcholine is not released. Thus, muscles don't contract and don't respond to nerve impulses. It usually takes about 24 to 72 hours to have symptoms, so it's not exactly immediate, like in a few hours, but the effects are long-lasting, 8 to 12 weeks, and it peaks at day 10. Um, and while new nerve terminals can sprout, it usually takes like three to four months, and this is why it can cause death. If it hits the wrong muscle in the synaptic cleft, you know, you're done for. Um, thankfully, the body can develop antibodies, but if you're using this as a treatment, obviously that's not 
the best thing. So they've actually been looking into using new treatments of the toxin and they're studying serotype B and reformulating Botox. I would like to give special thanks to these authors in particular for enhancing my knowledge on the subject and um, I would like to give them credit for the information used in this video. If you guys would like to learn more, I highly recommend these sources. Thanks for watching my video and stay safe and healthy.